Hallelujah. Well, praise God. How many glad to be in the Lord's house tonight? How many glad you defeated the devil and made it here? Yeah. Hallelujah. Would you lift your hand and just say the devil is a liar? Come on. Praise God. Praise God. And can you say, and the Lord is truth. Amen. Praise God. Pastor Margie's back with the teens tonight ministering. So we're believing God for a great outpouring there as we believe God for every week. And then that means we get to see uh, Caleb and Fallon right here uh, tonight with us. Praise God. Some of you didn't think they ever made it on Wednesday nights, but they do. They just have been in the back. Praise God. If you've got a Bible, would you turn with me first to Acts chapter 13, the book of Acts, the 13th chapter. Hallelujah. I'm going to share tonight a teaching uh, on, on spiritual warfare. Somebody say spiritual warfare. Now, I don't know if you know it or not, but there is warfare that's going on. And not one Christian is exempt from the battle. <laughs> I'm going to say that again. Not one Christian is exempt from the battle. And you say, well, well, I think I am. No, it just, it, that just means you haven't been wrestling. The scripture says, we'll read it in a minute. It says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. The problem is a lot of believers wrestle not. Hmm, I'm going to say that again. Scripture says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But a lot of modern believers simply wrestle not. So what does that mean? That means the enemy comes in and, and they just tap out. They just give up, give in, roll over, say, I'm done. But the Bible says that if we know our identity, we know greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. The greater one is in you. You've got the victory, but, but a lot of Christians are living with a, a, a small God and a great big devil. I'm going to say that again. I know, I know, just nudge somebody and say, he knows this doesn't apply to you, but, but it's just good for you to hear it anyway, right? No, sometimes it applies to all of us. We, we live life as if, as if God is, is just, no, we believe he's big. We'd say he's big. We praise him and sing like he's big. But I'm talking about the way we are going about our everyday life. Sometimes we're living like God is smaller than the devil. And we've got a big, big boogeyman and a small, small Jesus. Jesus, but can I just remind you, it is absolutely the opposite. We've got a great big God. Hallelujah. The earth is his, his footstool. The heavens are his throne. Somebody, would you lift your hand and say, he's the great one. And the devil, come on, somebody declare the devil is the small one. I like what T.L. Osborne said. T.L. Osborne said, if I didn't know how ugly, disgusting, despicable, ornery, mean, wicked the devil was and is, I'd have to feel sorry for him. I think I need to say that again. Some of you are looking at me funny. He said, if I didn't know how despicable, how ugly, how ornery, how mean, how wicked the devil is, I'd have to feel sorry for him. Why? Why would he have to feel sorry for him? Because the devil is fighting against God. And it's not an even match. Oh, I felt the Holy Ghost right there. I said it's not an even match. In fact, in fact, it's not even close. I'm going to say that again. I said it's not even close. My God, I'm going to say it a third time. It's not an even match. It's not even a close match. The devil is so outnumbered, so outmatched, even the demons. The Bible said one-third of the angels fell. That leaves two-thirds that didn't fall. I wish you'd hear me. So for every one demon there is, there are two holy angels that are warring and ministering on behalf of God's people. Hallelujah. 
Come on. Will you shake yourself tonight and say it's time I stop believing the devil's lie and acting like he's so big and bad and ugly and God is so tiny and small and I can barely make it and just hope I survive. God, God didn't shed the blood. Jesus didn't pour out his blood. Jesus didn't go into hell and be risen again so you would just barely get by. Come on. He said I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Woo, hallelujah. You missed a good chance to give God some praise right there. Come on, can you lift your voice with me and just give Jesus some praise? Hallelujah. Oh, glory, 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 glory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So, so look at, look at this passage. I read this a few weeks ago while I was teaching on the help. But I want you to see it again. It says in verse 4, So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. From there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God. This is the first mission, the first assignment for Saul and Barnabas. And it says in verse 8, when they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus. They found him. They weren't looking for him, but they found him. Can I tell you, you weren't looking for the fight you're in tonight, but you found it. You weren't looking for this opposition you're experiencing tonight, but you found it. Now, how you deal with it is going to determine the outcome. It didn't catch God by surprise. God knew this sorcerer was there. Saul and Barnabas just didn't know it. They didn't get up one morning and say, let's see if we can find a sorcerer today who will oppose us. No, they didn't, say, they didn't say, let's see if we can find some opposition, if we can find an enemy, if we can find some trouble. They just got up that day, said, Lord, let your kingdom come and your will be done. And the enemy said, I don't want his kingdom to come. I don't want his will to be done. And so the enemy set some opposition in their pathway. And they found it. Come on. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You found some battles. You found some warfare. And, and you say, well, I just don't know if I can make it. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You gotta, you, we, we've got to stop living out of Adam and live out of Christ. Hallelujah. And you say, well, how do I do that? It begins simply with a choice. With the decision, and we'll come to that in a minute. They found this sorcerer. Now, now look, in verse 8, it said, But Elamus the sorcerer, it's another name that he had. Elamus, Bar-Jesus, this Jewish false prophet, he's a sorcerer. He works in black magic. He partners with demons. This is not a magician. This is not someone who uses sleight of hand. This is not someone who tricks. This is someone who has given himself to demonic entities. He's demonized. He partners with demons. He thinks he's controlling them, but they're really controlling him. He's a sorcerer. And he withstood them. That word withstood means oppose. Somebody say he opposed them. Seeking to turn the proconsul away. It wasn't Paul. It wasn't Saul. It wasn't Barnabas that he was, he was really opposing. It was the word they were delivering that he was opposing. Come on, you need, to, you need to understand it's really not so personal. You and I tend to take everything personal. It's really not you the devil hates. It's that God part that's in you that he hates. It's really not you the devil's trying to stop. It's that, that calling that God has placed on you that the enemy's after. So, so they withstood. They were withstood by the demonic powers. Now, I want you to look at me for a moment. Some of you may be struggling with whether or not this is real. Can I tell you there are two extremes in spiritual warfare that we're, we're going to avoid. The one extreme is to see, the, to see demons and devils behind everything. To see demons and devils behind every issue, every problem. Can I just tell you, I'm talking about spiritual warfare tonight, but can I just say this lovingly as a papa in the house? Can I just say to you, some of your issues really aren't demons. It's just disobedience. 
You just start obeying. Sometimes it's not, it's, it's just laziness. Can I tell you, God can use any man, any woman, regardless of anything they've ever done. I don't know of anyone God can't do something great with except a lazy person. We're going to get quiet. God can't do much with lazy. I'm not getting any amens, but I'm going to teach it anyway. I said, God can't do much with lazy. No, he's got to have somebody who'll partner with him. Somebody who'll make themselves available. Come on. Hallelujah. So I look at somebody and say, he's going to make you mad before it's over. But hallelujah. Hopefully this mad going to get you free in the name of Jesus. Come on. Thank you for that okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, so, so here this, this pro council is wanting to hear the word. And here Saul and Barnabas are there. And here this enemy says, I'm going to stop the word. I'm going to stop the plan, the purpose of God. And he's working in demonic activity. Now, uh, you, we've got to avoid... We've got to avoid the extreme of seeing a demon behind everything. You know what I'm talking about. The devil, the devil. Everybody, sometimes people see the devil. You know, they have a problem in the sound system in church. Something glitches in the sound system, and they stop and have a 10-minute uh, shouting, praise, uh, re rebuking the devil that's in the sound system. You ever seen that? Oh, that devil's trying to stop the sound system tonight. Let's just pray against him and get everybody going a concert of prayer against the devil in the sound system. And most likely, it's not the devil. Most likely, we just don't know how to run it. Most likely, we just never read a manual. Most likely, we, 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 put, we hooked in some cords that, that we stepped on and we bent the wrong way and we created a little short in there. And most likely, it's not the devil. It's just the short. I'm losing amens right now. But we like, some people just like to blame the devil for everything. They just want to, you know, my dad was, was traveling with a preacher, uh, a friend, and they were doing a lot of meetings together and had some, the guy had some car trouble. And they went out and they looked at it. And uh, it was obvious, this is an older vehicle, it was back in the 70s, it was obvious that the spark plugs needed to be changed. And so it needed some spark plugs changed. Well, so they talked about it. Uh, about a, a month later, they're headed out to a meeting to preach, and the car breaks down. And they go up front and lift it up, and, and that preacher's just, just, you know, oh, that old devil, that old devil, he's just fooling around, can't get it, won't crank. That devil, that devil. Dad looked in there and said, hey, did you ever change the spark plugs? He said, no. Dad said, well, then stop, stop blaming the devil. Come on. That's not the devil. That's laziness. Hallelujah. I'm going to amen myself. Amen. Come on. But there's another extreme. And the other extreme is when we pretend there are no demons. When we pretend to go to the other side and pretend that, that everything is just human issues. We've got to learn how to walk in the balance. And you say, well, how do I know if it's demonic? Or how do I know if it's just human? Somebody lift your hand and say, I pray. And the Lord will tell me, the Holy Spirit will give you discerning of spirits. And the scripture said, test every spirit to see if it be of God or not. And so some spirits are from God. Some spirits are from the devil. And some spirits are just human. Come on. And, but you can pray. I believe God will show us what it is because he, he doesn't want us to be ignorant. He wants us to be wise. So Paul, Paul knows what this is, but you need to understand. I've had moments. Dad has had moments. I've had moments uh, where, where even when I'd stand up to preach, there was a spiritual attack released against us. Someone working in witchcraft trying to stop the purpose of God. And there have been times when, when I went through a season where I'd step up to preach and just a few minutes into the teaching or preaching, this, this dizziness would, would come. This, this unexplainable, sudden dizziness where I'd have to hold on. I don't know how many times I had to hold on to the pole. Nobody knew that I was holding on and I'm preaching the word, but I'm holding on because I feel like I'm about to faint and pass out. And it wasn't something I did 
didn't feel it. I didn't feel it two seconds before, 30 seconds before, three minutes before. It was the enemy trying to stop the word of God from coming out. Come on. And you say, well, no, you just make, no, I'm not making that up. I, I've been there. But you say, well, well, what'd you do? I just kept preaching. Hallelujah. I wish you'd hear me. I just kept doing what I was called of God to do because would you lift your hand and say, greater is he that's in you. Hallelujah. You don't give up at, at, the, at the attack. You, you stand your ground. Having done all to stand, somebody lift your hand and say, I got to stand. Look, that's what Saul did. Then Saul, verse 9. So there's opposition. We don't know. We don't know if Saul felt a, a, a sharp pain hit him. We don't know if he felt that dizziness. We don't know physically what he experienced. But we do know this man's operating in demonic power. But it said, then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. Somebody lift up your hand and say, I need to be filled again. Now, you need to understand he was already full when he showed up. When he got there, Paul was already full of the Holy Spirit. But he was filled afresh when he faced something he had never faced before. That's the help. Hallelujah. And we might could say, we might could say it wasn't so much that he was filled again as we understand it. It may simply be that as he stood there, filled afresh with the Holy Spirit, there was an unveiling so that he saw what it was he already had and he was able to minister out of that. Because he looked, look what it said. It said he looked intently at the man. Look, if the enemy's coming after you, don't drop your eyes. Don't look, don't scooter. You look him right in the eye. I had a guy tell me one night, uh, I think I've told you before, after a crusade, he came up to me and I said, son, you got to get right with God, sir. You, you need to really surrender to God. He looked at me with wild eyes and he said, preacher, you want me to show you I'm going to surrender to God? You, just a snarl and, a, and, a, and a, a snide look in his face. He said, I'll show you how serious I am. Reached under his t-shirt and pulled out a knife about that big, held it up at me. You say, well, what'd you do? You just keep looking. Just like Paul did. He threw the knife down and ran. Hallelujah. Come on, greater is he that's in you. I said, greater is he that's in you. I'm going to say it again. Greater is he that is in us than he that is against us. Hallelujah. So, so look what, what he did. It said, then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you and you shall be blind, watch this, not seeing the sun for a time. God doesn't put permanent blindness on anybody. The judgment of God is not punitive, it's redemptive. Hallelujah, I'm going to say it again. The judgment of God is not punitive, it's redemptive. So God allowed this blindness to come on this man, not to punish him eternally, but hopefully to wake him up out of the place he's in so he would call on the name of the Lord. I don't think that he did. At least he didn't that day, but I, I hope he did. Somebody say amen. Immediately a dark mist fell on him and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the pro council believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter six, would you? So here's an example. I just read an example to you in the Bible of spiritual warfare. When the enemy came to oppose... Now, don't think it's strange when you find opposition, when you're doing well and suddenly you're opposed. That's normal. Normal Christianity. I'm not going to get any amens. I'm not going to get any help because this just, if we're not careful, this, this millennial Z generation, we, we want everything to be easy. 
We want everything to be handed to us. We, we don't want the helper. We want the doer. We don't want the Holy Spirit who helps us do. We want the Holy Spirit who does. But he's not the Holy Spirit who does it all. He's the Holy Spirit who helps you do what God has called you to do. The Holy Spirit will not say no to temptation for you. But when you say no, the Holy Spirit will step up and rise up and strengthen you so that that no will be enforced in your life. My, I felt, I felt a witness right then. The Holy Spirit will not get you out of bed to pray. But when you get out of bed to pray, the Holy Spirit will help you. Oh, hallelujah. The Holy Spirit will not make you read the word and study the word. But when you pick up the word, the Holy Spirit will help you. Come on. Hallelujah. He's the helper. Can you say, he's my helper? Hallelujah. Look at Ephesians 6, because he's going to help you, and this is going to help you tonight. Anybody get anything out of this? Finally, my brethren. Finally, my brethren. And this isn't, this isn't Paul saying, I'm about to close for the third time. This is the real closing. This is Paul saying, finally, he's saying, above everything else. He's saying, now, everything else that I've taught is leading up to this. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Can we read it aloud? Verse 10 of Ephesians 6. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Come on, you're weak in yourself. Some of, some of us trying to be strong in ourselves. We're trying to be strong in our prayer life. We're trying to be strong in our devotion. We're trying to be strong in our works. And that's why we do good for a few days, a few weeks, and then we tripped all up again. You got to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I dare somebody lift up your hand and say, Holy Ghost, show me what that means. Not just in my head, but in my living. Show me how to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Look at verse 11. He said, okay, I'm going to answer that prayer you just prayed. Put on. Everybody say, put on. Put on, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the strategies, the plans of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Somebody say with me, but we do wrestle. We wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness, in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up. Take up. Notice all these action verbs. Put on. Take up. Come on, nut, put, punch somebody beside you and say, you can't just lay in your bed and get all of this. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able or made able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Having done what? Half of it? Three-fourths of it? Ninety-nine and a half of it? No, having done all. Having done all to stand. Now, that doesn't mean the, the weightiness of the work, the burden of the workload is on us. No, Jesus said his, his burden's light. His yoke is easy. That doesn't mean you got to, maybe you can get to, no, it just means you got to make up your mind. You got to believe and you've got to actively, intentionally set yourself to put on the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Are you still with me right now? Everybody say spiritual warfare. Preach with me and look at one person and say, it's a fact. For every Christian. I want you to look at me. The fight you're in is not about your eternal destiny so much. 
If you've been born again, Jesus said he lost no one that the Father had put in his hand. Come on, hallelujah. How many, how, now you say, can I backslide? Well, why in the world you want to? My God, hallelujah. I don't even think that should be a question. Come on, you say, Pastor Keith, don't you believe in backslide? No. What you believe in, you practice. Come on, I don't believe in backslide. Who wants to go back? I mean, there's nothing in hell I want. I said, there's nothing in hell I want. I'm going to say it again. There's not one thing in hell that I want. But praise God, there's heaven. Hallelujah. There's the glories of God. There's the fullness of his presence. There's the joy of the Lord. How many, how many want the things that are of heaven? Thank you, Jesus. So, so I, I, th this warfare, though, it's over you knowing who you are in Christ. It's not necessarily over, over your position in Christ, but it's you knowing who you are. That's the fight. And your, secondly, it's knowing who you are, number one. Secondly, it's living out who you are. That's what the enemy doesn't want. If he knows you're born again and you belong to Christ and you're going to heaven one day, he's warring against you to try to keep you from finding out who it is you really are now in Christ. And if he can keep you from knowing who you are, then he can keep you from living like who you are. Because sin, I believe sin is always a case of mistaken identity. Anytime I've committed sin, it's because at that moment I stepped out of knowing who it is that God says I really am. Oh, hallelujah. And if I learn, if I learn who I am in Christ and who he, he's called me to be, and if I learn how to live it out, that, that makes the devil nervous. Because all of us, I mean, just a Wednesday night, uh, a Wednesday night attendance. But if just us who are here on Wednesday night, it's a great attendance. But if just us who are here on Wednesday night, uh, uh, a fraction of who's here on Sunday morning. But how many understand if just you and I get it and we begin to live knowing who we are and living out who we are. My, you ought to lift your hand and say strongholds are fall. Come on. I mean, in your families, I feel, I feel the witness of God. Can you just, can you just praise God with me for a moment? Hallelujah. Can, hey, glory to God. Somebody, somebody just praise God that, that uh, we're going to do it. I said, we're going to do it. We're going to know who it is we are in Christ, what we've been given, what we're called to, and we're going to live it in the name of Jesus. We're going to see the kingdom of heaven come and the will of God being done. Somebody shout hallelujah. This is a spiritual fight. This is a spiritual fight. Now that's important. I'm going slow tonight because I just want, I want to get some, some foundational teaching in you about spiritual warfare. Since this is a spiritual fight, let me, let me say it this way. It's a spiritual fight that has ramifications in the natural world. But you must grasp this truth. It's spiritual. It's spiritual. There's a spirit realm. And there's an earthly realm. We, we, we live just thinking of earthly stuff. But there's a spiritual realm. And what does that mean? Well, let me tell you. I am a spirit. You are a spirit being. Anybody ever been to a funeral? Most of the funerals now are memorial services, cremations involved, and so so there's not so much going to that casket and looking. But if you have you ever viewed a casket, you, you've seen that body laying there. You recognized that body, didn't you? That was the body of a family member, a loved one, or a friend. You recognized that body, but there was nobody home. The body was there. They may have died with a perfect heart. And still on the death certificate is going to say something about heart failure. 
When they can't figure out what happened, they're just going to say heart failure, heart attack. Why? Because the heart stopped working. Why did it stop working? It was in perfect shape. The brain was perfect. The, the, every part of the body could have been perfect. But someone who lived inside that temporary house vacated the premises, and we call that death. Now, why is that important? Because it, it, we got to remember, we are spirit beings who have a soul and we live temporarily in a body. Oh, I know that. Yeah, but we don't live like it. We live as if we're bodies who have spirits. How do you know that? Because we spend the bulk of our time and the bulk of our energies and the bulk of our finances trying to make sure we get what's comfortable for the body. What the body wants. We want a nice house for our bodies to hang out in. I'm not a, God, 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 God wants to bless you with a nice house, but he doesn't want you to put that house as your priority. Come on, are you hearing me? We take care of this body. Look at somebody. Well, don't, but hallelujah. Amen. You know, thank God we take care of this body. We, we wash it. We, we, we primp it. We, we use the odor, and I hope, hallelujah. We, we put some cologne on it. But why, why do we have to put deodorant and cologne in? Uh, why do we have to bathe this whole thing? Because this is made of dirt, and it's going back. You're, you're not taking this with you. You say, well, I know that. Yeah, but we've not been living like it. Because we put all the effort and money and energy into whatever this body wants. But this body's temporary. It's going to be buried in the ground or cremated or burned up. But you're still going to be alive. You're either going to be living in the fullness of God's glory or you're going to be in an eternal situation of damnation. Jesus came so we'd all live in the fullness of his glory. Somebody say amen. Come on. Can I teach just a few more moments? So, so this is the, the fight we're in is not a physical fight. It's what do you say? We wrestle not against what? Flesh and blood. Will you lift your hand and say with me, people are never the enemy. We'll say that again. People are not your enemy. Your wife, your husband, your mom, your dad, dare I say even your ex. People are never your enemy. Oh, they may, be, they may have yielded themselves to the devil and being used by the devil, but if you're going to fight and win this war, you've got to step above people and fight in the spirit realm. Come on, you getting anything tonight? People are not the enemy. Uh, Dean Sherman said this. He said, because you're in a fight, if you don't fight the devil, you will fight people. You're in a fight. Every one of us tonight are in a fight. Because we're in a fight, if we don't learn how to fight the devil, we're going to end up fighting with people. And watch this. If you fight with people, he went on to say, if you fight with people, you're creating a negative effect in the spirit realm. Unity is a powerful weapon in your victory. Mm -mm -mm. Unity is something the devil doesn't like because when we get unified, what does scripture teach? One will put a thousand to flight, but two can put what? 10,000 to flight. Come on, that means three can put 100,000 to flight. I dare to lift up your hand and say that means just us here tonight. We could, we could deal some havoc to the demonic spirits that are fighting against our families if we can come into, remain in a place of unity. That means in your home. The enemy wants to come into your house and get the husband and the wife or the parents and the children or, or the siblings, whoever, the enemy wants to come in and get us fighting with flesh and blood. Because if we get to fighting with flesh and blood, we're creating negative, negative effects are happening in the spirit realm. What does that mean? It means we're, we're bolstering 
We're strengthening the enemy's attack. And we're weakening our defenses and our offense against him. So you got to understand, this is not about flesh and blood. When Paul dealt with that man, he, he dealt with the man, but he was really dealing with the demon. He, he said, you child of the devil. He wasn't just talking about the man being, the man had yielded himself to demonic spirits, but he was really dealing with the demon. And he, and hallelujah. And, and he showed the power. You say, why didn't he cast him out? Because evidently that man wasn't willing to be freed. And God's given us all free will and free choice. Are you hearing me? But what he did do was say, I want to show you. It was the Holy Spirit saying, I'm going to show you there's a greater power than you've ever known. And I'm going to let blindness come on you for a season uh, so you can learn who is the real power. Oh, how many glad that God's a redemptive God? Come on. How many glad that he's a good, good father? Hallelujah. So this is a spiritual warfare against a spiritual enemy. And to, do, to deal with it, we got to put on the full armor. To deal, what did he say? So that you can stand against the strategies, the wiles. Verse 11. Now, now let me slow down. I know some of you know this, but let me remind you. He says the enemy has strategies coming against us. The word strategies, wiles, it, it, it speaks of planning. What, is that, what does that mean? Here's what it means. It implies intelligence. Why is that important? Because when we talk about demonic spirits, evil spirits, we're not talking about impersonal forces. We're talking about personalities. In the Bible, demons are described as being able to talk. They make suggestions. They make accusations. Demons talk. Mm. Demons listen. They're described as listening and observing. Why, 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 why are they listening and observing? Well, they're really watching to see what strategy might work against you. They're watching habits. They're watching weeks, weaknesses to see what strategy might work against you. They talk. They make accusations. Maybe you, anybody here ever, ever messed up? Just two or three of us. Well, praise God, the rest of you willing to hang around us. But if you've ever messed up, can I just tell you something dad taught me? If you've ever sinned, tripped up, it is not, it is not the sin that is, your, it, 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 that is your greatest danger. It is if you listen to the voice of the accuser while you're down. Because he'll come with condemnation and tell you immediately, how bad you are, how worthless you are, how, how, how you can never be good enough, you can never live this thing, you'll never make it. He'll come with accusations, and if you buy those lies, you'll stay down. And why does the enemy come immediately to accuse you? Because he knows that even though you've fallen, even though you sinned, even though you knew better and shouldn't have done it, but he knows the heart of Father toward you. And he knows that the very moment you cry out, Oh God, have mercy on me. Forgive me of my sin. He, at the very moment you say, Lord, save me, he knows the hand of the Lord is going to reach down to wherever you are and lift you up again out of the miry clay and you ought to help me praise a loving heavenly Abba right now come on hallelujah hallelujah so the enemy wants to accuse you he talks to you now he'll make suggestions to try to trip you up he'll suggest that you look at that he'll suggest that you click on this he'll suggest that you say this Holy Spirit will say shut up maybe to you he talks politer but to me, he's got to just talk a little, a little rough. The Holy Spirit will say, oh, don't say that. And, and, but the, the, the enemy be trying to suggest what you could do to get even, to get your point across, to prove that you're right. 
See, demons are personalities. They talk, they listen, they think, and they reason. You're not fighting flesh and blood. You're fighting spiritual personalities. Come on. Is this helping anybody? You say, well, uh, that's intimidating. No, you never have to be intimidated by a, a, a devil that's already lost. Hallelujah. I said you don't have to be intimidated. God's not giving you the spirit of fear. And if you're, if you're feeling fearful just talking about it, that's just that enemy trying to suggest. Trying to, try, he's talking, he's trying to, he's trying to tell you, so, ah, but the devil, come on, how many, has anybody ever learned that the devil's a liar? Has anybody found out that the devil's a liar? Come on, so if he's ever told you you're worthless, you ought to lift both hands and say, praise God, that means I'm worthy. If he's ever told you you'll never make it, you ought to rejoice and say, that means I've got it made. If he's ever said you can never be who God's called you to be, you ought to, you ought to get a little radical and say, hallelujah, that means I'm going to be exactly who God has said I'll be. Come on, somebody to help me praise Jesus in this room. Go ahead. Give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah. So, so what do we do? And I got to bring this home tonight. Look with me at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. 1 Timothy 6, 12. We got to fight. Look, look, tell somebody, fight. Come on. Fight. Anybody remember in school how you used to yell when you saw there was a fight going on? <laughs> fight! Everybody went running to see what it was. But you got to fight. We got to fight. Caleb, we got to fight. 1 Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight of faith. Fight! 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 I'm going to say it. Fight, fight, fight. Fight. What does it mean to fight? Anybody ever been in a fight? If you're fighting, you don't sit back and just let them pummel you. I'm just enduring until it's over. <laughs> you idiot. Sorry. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> you do. You fight. Fight the good fight. This is Paul's admonition to his son, Timothy, who's in Ephesus. Do you know that everyone, practically everyone in Ephesus came from an occultic background? Witchcraft, idolatry. And most Christians, when they were born again, many of those Christians were still living in homes where they were practicing witchcraft. Now, today we say, well, they couldn't make it as strong believers. The devil is a liar. Yeah. Paul writes the book of Ephesians, and he writes First and Second Timothy to Timothy, who's in Ephesus leading, and he says, you can make it. You can make it. I wish you'd hear me. You can overcome. You, you, you and I can never reach anybody we're intimidated by. God wants to deliver us. Can I just say that the Lift Church is going to be delivered from intimidation, from our culture and our society, from, from your family members that don't know Christ yet? Come on, you're going to be delivered from being intimidated so that you can be a bold vessel to bring deliverance and salvation. And if you believe it, somebody say amen. Hallelujah. Don't, don't be intimidated. Sometimes the intimidation is very outward, vocal. Sometimes it's, it's more intelligent and quieter. But either way, I refuse. I've spent too much of my life being intimidated. Greater is he that is in me. Hallelujah. I said, greater is he that is in me. So look at somebody and say, you got to fight. And he said, fight the good fight. What's a good fight? And we live, we live in a time when we give, uh, we think every person is supposed to have a participation award. We, th we, we think that that's going to make strong adults. It's going to make weak adults. Oh, getting quiet in here. Oh, I just don't want to see that little one cry. Let them cry. 
And I'm not being mean. I love, come on, if you all know me, I, I'm tenderhearted. If I've ever had to discipline Isabella, I cried more than she did. I, I am tenderhearted, but I don't want to be so tenderhearted. You know, if you're too tenderhearted, you see, the, you see the butterfly struggling to get out of the cocoon. And you think, oh, that poor little thing. I'm going to go over there and help it. And so you go over there and you take a little pocket knife and you gently cut the cocoon to allow that little, little butterfly to get out. And you feel so good about yourself because you helped him. You, you, you helped him. He didn't have to struggle like that. But what you just did was kill him. You just signed his death certificate. Because it is in the struggling that he gets the strength he needs to be able to fly. Come on. Hallelujah. We're, we're trying so hard to take away from our children and our grandchildren any situation and circumstance that would be difficult for them. We're trying. I'm going to lose amens right now. We've been trying for a generation now to take away anything that would be difficult in the name of love, but it's backfiring because they haven't learned. Oh, they haven't learned how to how to how to reach in to the depth of who they really are and be strong. Come on. Are you, are you with me right now? So that's why. Can I just uh, you say, well, why are you talking about this tonight? Because that's why Father God, Abba, Daddy, that's why he lets you go through stuff that doesn't feel good. That's why sometimes it seems like he's a million miles away. He's not. He said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. He's just testing you to see if you'll believe that he'll never leave you or forsake you. He's testing your obedience. God does not test you with temptation of any kind, but he tests us with obedience. He tests us. He says, now, I'm not going to let you feel it right now. I'm not going to let you see the answer to every prayer you've been praying right now. I'm going to delay it just a little bit, not because I don't love you. No, it's actually that I do love you. I want you to learn how to fight. It's a good fight. You're already going to win it. I've already said that you're the winner. I wish you'd hear me right now. I say, God's already said that you're the winner, not because... Not just because you, you participated, because he participated and he overcame. Yeah. Hallelujah. Come on, can I, can I preach just a little bit longer? Will you lift your hand and say, I want to be strong. Anybody want to be strong? How many, how many want to raise children that are strong? How many want to raise children that know, that know uh, when the wind's blowing, they know how to stand and don't fall apart every time something happens? My, I don't mean to pick on a generation, but come on, think of this. In, in, in 1940s, there was a world war, and 19, 20, and 21 year old, 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds were going across the sea to Europe and to Asia to fight war. And they won. Guess what we do now with 19, 20, 21, 22 year olds? Their, their political candidate loses. And professors give them breaks from their classes and counseling so they can deal with the trauma of their candidate not winning the election. That doesn't mean these kids are bad. It just means a generation cut the cocoon and these 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 young ones don't know how don't know they don't know how strong they can be my so you're in a warfare you found some opposition somebody lift up your hand and say but it's a good fight God said I win hallelujah come on I said God said I win Oh, praise God. Y'all, come on, you need to say that so that you hear yourself say it. I can't fight your battle for you. I can't, I can't win your warfare for you. I'll come alongside you and I'll help you, but I can't do it for you. But if you'll fight, you're going to win. He said, fight the good fight of faith. And I dare somebody, I dare everybody to put your hands together until they sting just a little bit and give God a victorious shout of praise that we win. Come on, we win. Fight. We're going to fight. Hallelujah. 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 We're going to fight. 
We're going to fight and we're going to win. Look with me. Look with me. First Timothy 1 19. Hallelujah. My, my, my. Fight the good fight. You'll win it. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 19. Well, let's look at verse 18. Here's, a, here's one way you can fight. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you. I, I could say that to some of you. I could say this charge I commit to you, son Caleb, son, son Christian, son Jonathan. I go, I go on, call some daughters. This charge I commit to you according to the prophecies. The, the, the prophetic promises that have gone out over you. Don't, don't you, prophecy is not given for celebration. It's given for preparation. Every prophecy that's ever been spoken over you, Jonathan, was not for you to celebrate. Oh, it's wonderful. Ooh. It was for you to prepare. And one way you prepare is, is Caitlin takes those prophetic words, promises, Watch this. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, daughter Caitlin, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. So daughter Fallon takes the promises and fights with them. Oh, hallelujah. Come on. Carla and Jack and Kayla and I feel like I got to name everybody because it's only everybody. Hallelujah. You, you take the promises and you fight with them. Don't fight the promise. You say, I, I, how do I fight? You fight the promise if you're fighting the process. Stop fighting the promise. Don't fight the process. God's got a process to get you to the promise. And the prophecy is to prepare you for the fulfillment of the promise. Stop fighting it, but fight with it. Use it against the enemy. The enemy says you're not going to do it. You say, no, devil. Here's the promise that I've received. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. I said glory to God. Mm, hallelujah. Anybody got some promises, prophetic words that have been declared over your life? Hallelujah. Will you just lift both hands right now, take 30 seconds, and just praise God for them? Hallelujah. And, and don't, go ahead, speak some over your life. Speak something over your life. Declare. Hallelujah. 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 Declare some things. <laughs> oh, glory, glory, glory. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Life. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. What has God said to you? What has God said about you? What has God said for you? Go ahead and, and prophesy it again and say, look, that's, that's, why, that's why you should have these things, you should have these things written out. You, you need to, when you get a pro, you need to get the recording of it or you need to, you need to get it written out. See, I've got, I've got some recordings and I've got some things written out. Hallelujah. And I, I listen to them. Hallelujah. I read them. And I pray them periodically. Take that word and say, here's what, here's what the Most High God said. And I proclaim it. What am I doing? I'm fighting. Somebody say, hallelujah. I'm waging good warfare. Good warfare. Look at verse 19, though. He said, by them, by the prophecies, wage a, the good. Everybody say, the good warfare. There it is twice. He said, it's a good fight. It's a good warfare. That means you win. Having faith. Everybody say, having faith. And a good conscience. What does that mean? Faith is my position in Christ. A good conscience means I'm living it. Having faith and a good conscience. I'm living right. I'm living it. Let me get real practical. What does it mean? It means I put gas in the tank. It means I keep oil in the engine. What does that mean for a Christian? <laughs> come on. You knew I was going to come to it, right? You knew I was going to say it. It means I put the Word of God as first priority, final authority in my life. What did David say? 
some, some of us are struggling with temptation. Some of us are growing lukewarm and cold. Some of us, what did David say? Your word. Not, not, a, not a praise song. David was a praiser. But he didn't say, the latest tune. He said, your word have I hidden in my heart. I, got, I put your word into my spirit being. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. He said, I discovered the key. Now, David struggled with temptation. David failed. But he said, I, I discovered the key. The key to winning that battle is to put God's word in my heart. Come on. So how are you doing with putting gas in the tank and oil in the engine? He said, you're going to win having, a, having faith and a good conscience. Is this helping anybody tonight? You see, just reading the Bible, just reading a verse. I mean, if you're really battling and you don't feel like reading, read anyway. And if you feel like you've been reading, but you just can't remember 10 minutes later what it was you read, read anyway. Because just the act of reading is an act of fighting against the enemy. And then, and then praise. When you don't feel like it, you still lift your hand. I praise you, Jesus. Look, I, I've walked with God since I was a little boy. But can I tell you, there have been some seasons in my life where I just struggle to even say that. Just fighting. Maybe I'd fed. Look, if you feed Adam, Adam's going to be dominant in you. But if you feed the spirit man who's created like Jesus, that spirit is going to be dominant in you. It's whoever you're feeding. And there have been times in my life, I'll just be real, there have been times when I've struggled. But I found out something, whether it was opposition, the enemy really coming against me, or my own weakness just crippling me in my mind because I knew I hadn't lived up to everything the way I should have. Sometimes I just struggled to read, but I found out if I just read anyway, it's fighting. And if I just open my mouth to praise Jesus, come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever struggled to get the words out of your mouth? But how many have discovered that when you got the words out of your mouth, something began to change? Come on, hallelujah. Why? Because the Holy Spirit won't do it for us, but he will help us when we do it. Hallelujah. So I dare you to look, hallelujah. I, I'd, like, I'd like to go on because we gotta, we, gotta, we gotta put on the armor. We'll talk about that another time. But, but there are two ways, two, two things you got to do in spiritual warfare. One is exalt Jesus. Everybody say, I got to exalt Jesus. Worship is warfare. Worship is warfare. Whenever I really enter into worship, I'm exalting Jesus. One way I exalt Jesus is by reading his word. Why? Because I'm saying I believe it. I believe this is, this is God's word. I believe that, that this book is powerful. I believe what Jesus said in John 6, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. They are life. Ooh. I exalt Jesus by praising him. Praise God. That's warfare. The enemy is allergic to real worship. How many would like to give the devil hives every time he comes around you? give the devil hives every time at Brad and Autumn's house when the enemy's trying to come in and they, they, they catch it, they discern it, they recognize it they say this is a spiritual thing we're going to deal with it in the spirit and when they pray together when they, when they maybe by themselves and together but they just lift their voice and begin to praise God rehearsing the prophecies that have gone out over Brad and Autumn they just hallelujah rehearse those prophecies 
and begin to praise God. Every demonic spirit that's been sent to attack him, try to trip him up, stop him, just begins to break out in hives because he can't take it. He doesn't like it. When, when we lift our voice to give God praise, especially when we're in a low place. Hallelujah. Can I just tell you the, the greatest praise God ever hears is not when we praise him from the mountaintop, jumping in celebration because we can see what he's done. The greatest praise is when we're in the valley. Maybe we're in a dungeon and shackles are on our feet and we feel like we've messed it up and we've lost and nothing good is going to come of this and, and this is the end. But we dare to lift our voice anyway out of that low place. We dare to lift our voice and begin to sing his praises. Hallelujah. Ah, that's warfare against the enemy. Come on. Hallelujah. The second thing. So number one, everybody, everybody stand with me and say, number one, I exalt Jesus. In fact, would you lift one hand and say, I exalt Jesus. This is how we fight our battles. That's what the song's about. We oftentimes jump in the middle of singing it and some people are going, oh, what? But, but how, we, how do we fight our battle? We exalt Jesus. Number one, we exalt Jesus. James chapter four, verse seven says, when the devil's coming at you, opposing you, coming against you, therefore submit yourself to God. Submit to God. Worship, true worship, is submitting to God. Now you can worship where people see you, and that's not real worship. You, you can dance, jump, do all that, and not be real. But real worship is submission. Submission. I'm not a real worshiper. Can I just tell you? I might appear to be a true worshiper to every one of you. But if I'm harboring unrepentant sin in my heart, that's not true worship. Because real worship is always, always involves submission. Submitting to God. But what's the rest of that verse, James 4, 7? Submit yourselves unto God. Resist the devil. And he will flee from you. So lift that hand and say, exalt Jesus. Lift the other hand and say, and resist the devil. Now, when I exalt Jesus, that takes care of probably 80, 90% of all the devils. Just my exalting Jesus will take care of, of 80, 90% of all the devils. But sometimes I got to open my mouth and address specifically the demonic spirit and say in the name of Jesus, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. Hallelujah. And I command you to get out of my house, out of my mind, off my body. Come on. Sometimes you got to do, I, can I just tell you something? There, there have been times when driving down the road, you just got to pull over roll the window down on the passenger side and say, get out. If you need to, park, walk around, open the door and say, I said, get out. Oh, you're looking at me funny. But you just do whatever you've got to do to show the enemy that you are resisting him. You are putting your foot down. Devil, you're not, you're, I'm not giving you place. That, isn't that what the Bible says? Give no place to the devil. I'm not giving you place Get out in the name of Jesus. And what did the Bible say? When you exalt Jesus, submitting to God, when you resist the enemy, hallelujah, what do you say? He will. The devil has to what? He has to what? He has to what? Do you know one translation says, flee as in terror. The demons that have been sent to terrorize you become terrorized. Glory to God. Because, because you've lear you're learning how to fight this fight. Praise God. Does this help anybody tonight? Will you, take, will you take two minutes with me? Maybe three. Will you lift your hands? Will you just su surrender to Jesus right now? If there's sin in your life, will you repent of it right now? I mean, repent of it, change your mind, change your thinking, stop excusing it, stop liking it. Your flesh likes it, but you are not your flesh. You are a redeemed Holy Ghost 
born again child of the Most High God. Hallelujah. So speak out of your spirit and not out of your flesh person and declare, declare repentance. Just repent right now in the name of Jesus. Come on and just open yourself up to the Lord and say, Lord, cleanse me, purify me, deliver me, change me in the name of Jesus. Everyone watching, do the same right now. Come on. Yes. Come on. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus, I glorify you. I magnify you. Lord, we surrender to you right now. We submit ourselves to you in the name of Jesus. Come on, submit to the Lord. Take another 60 seconds. It doesn't take six hours. It can happen in 60 seconds if you'll mean it. Just submit it to the Lord. Say, help me, Lord. Have mercy on me, Lord. I yield myself to you. I repent. Oh, God, forgive me for being so self-focused. I give myself to you. I thank you for the prophetic promises that have been declared over my life. I'm not going to let them go. I'm not going to I'm not going to not believe. I'm not going to stand in unbelief and draw back, but I'm going to hold on and run toward you. Hallelujah. Thanking you, Lord, that every promise you've made is mine and will be my reality. I give you praise. I give you thanks. I give you glory. I give you worship. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Now, now lift your hand and open your mouth and resist the devil. Resist the devil. Open your mouth, use your words, and tell the devil to go. Tell him to go out of your head. Tell him to go out of your body. Tell him to get out of your life in the name of Jesus. Come on. If you've been born again, washed in the blood of Jesus, if you submitted to God, then resist the devil, and he must flee away. Satan, the Lord, rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ, the strong Son of God. We take authority over everything every demonic force, every lying voice, every spirit of hell, every power of the enemy sent to, to steal, to kill, and destroy in the name of Jesus. Go from God's people. Go from their minds. Go from their bodies. Go from their thinking in the name of Jesus. Loose them and go. Go into the uninhabited places. Every spirit of darkness in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, bow to the Lordship of Christ. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody open your mouth and declare Jesus is Lord. Come on, can you declare Jesus is Lord over my life? Come on, praise him, praise him just another moment. Praise him, praise him in this place. Praise him just another minute. Oh, Hallelujah. this is how I fight. Praise him, depression, go in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Anger, go in Jesus' name. Strongholds of lust, be destroyed in Jesus' name. Strongholds of bitterness and unforgiveness be broken up in Jesus' name. Powers of religion go in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We plead the blood of Jesus over every person on the sound of our voice. We take authority over every attempt of the enemy through witchcraft and any other means. We declare the promise of Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon formed against this people shall prosper. And every tongue that has risen in judgment, this people shall condemn. For this is their heritage. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of you. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. So thank you for cleansing. Thank you for freeing. Thank you for feeling. Come on, will you lift your hands and just ask him to fill you afresh with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, even as, as Saul became Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. Lord, fill us afresh. Fill us afresh. Unveil. Unveil in our understanding what it is you've given us. Unveil in our understanding the depth of, of who it is who lives in us. Oh, fill us again as we submit to you. Well, thank you. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm going 
going to ask you, I'm going to ask you to do one more thing as we get ready, to, as we leave here tonight. I'm going to ask you to open your mouths. Hallelujah. You got to open your mouth. You got to open your mouth and declare it. You have, you have, but let's leave here declaring something. I mean, open your mouth radical. Get radical. You still may not feel it. It's not by feelings. It's by faith. Hallelujah. You say, well, why won't God let me feel it right now? Don't worry about that. He's your loving heavenly papa, and he's not going to do anything bad to you. Hallelujah. He may just be, he may be letting you stretch your wings inside the cocoon a little bit. Push against something a little bit so that you can discover how strong you really are in him. Would you lift your voice? The Bible says it this way. And please, we don't want to do this as, a, as hype. We don't want to do it as emotionalism. We don't want to do it as just flesh. We've done it too often like that. The Bible says... Clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God. Watch this. With a voice of triumph. That doesn't mean you see triumph yet. Doesn't mean you feel it yet. But you have the voice. You're declaring it. You're declaring it. You're declaring it. You're declaring it. It's spiritual warfare. You're declaring it. Hallelujah. So can, can we close tonight? Can we close tonight just by following the mandate of that verse putting our hands together lifting our voice with a voice of triumph praising God for victory in this warfare in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus hallelujah let's do it let's do it God bless you I love you we're going to see you Sunday